Welcome back to another episode of Bree Bree Talks MMA. Shama, UFC 300 is a wrap. I am so just grateful, blessed, excited. So many different emotions. It was the best weekend of my life. I have never experienced that type of energy before at a live sporting event. You know, it's uh, it's definitely like everybody told me that like going to the UFC is just a different energy and like it's a really cool experience. And I think until you actually experience it, it's hard to grasp really. But yeah, it was awesome. And I'm going to be doing a UFC 300 vlog. So I'll post that soon and that will kind of give you guys a whole summary of my trip and my experience doing media at UFC 300. But for this episode, I really just want to talk about the fights and talk about what is next for a lot of these fighters. So let's go ahead and just get right into it and start with the first fight on the early prelims. Devison Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt. Honestly, kind of went exactly how I expected. I mean, I was expecting a little bit more from Cody, to be honest. He seemed a little bit hesitant. He seemed maybe even a little gun shy, which kind of surprised me because I felt that Cody had the speed advantage in the striking. So I felt that if he kept the fight on the feet, would have a better chance of winning. Devison did an excellent job just controlling the octagon. The first round was kind of a feeling out process, I guess you could say. And Cody did throw some nice leg kicks. His chin held up pretty well. I mean, Devison threw some really powerful shots at him. And we saw, you know, in the Rob Font fight, what happened when um, Rob Font got hit by, by some of those. So I think that Cody, he did better than I expected in some ways and worse than I expected in other ways. But um, great performance from Figueredo. He definitely had the better grappling in this fight, which is honestly kind of what I expected. I really thought that Cody had the advantage in the striking and Devison had the advantage in the grappling. Um, I'm kind of wondering if this is more of a mental thing for Cody rather than a skill thing because we've seen Cody perform at the highest level and I don't know that Figueredo is any better than some of the the fighters that Cody has beat. So I, I don't know. I don't think Cody's done. I don't think he's like needs to retire or anything. I just I'm wondering because his last fight he looked amazing. And then this fight seems like something was just missing. Um, but sometimes that's just how it goes. You know, sometimes your opponent is just their night. And... That's what it looked like. You know, it was it was Figueredo's night. And yeah, he looked excellent. He got a second round submission and it was it was fantastic. I um yeah, I really really was hoping to see more from Cody, like I said, but um that's just what happens, you know. I think that Cody still definitely has a lot of potential. I just don't know if he's gonna make another title run. I don't know. Um, what to expect from him but I'll always be a Cody Garbrandt fan and I hope that you know he can put it together in his next performance Um, but yeah this just might have just been a tough matchup for him because Figueredo even though this is a new weight class like Figueredo was a a champion before And, and Cody was too to his credit but Figueredo I actually think is better at Bantamweight than he was at Flyweight. I think that this was a great move for him, definitely. So I'm curious to see who he gets matched up with next and how he does in his next fight at Bantamweight. But so far, I really like what I've seen from Figueredo. He hasn't faced a ton of adversity, so we'll see. He's now ranked number six, so he's making his way up. And I think... You know, it, Bantamweight is hard because it's a very deep division. It's a very difficult division. It's a very technical division. But I think that maybe in the near future, we could potentially see Figueredo fighting for a title. So let's move on to the second fight of the night. 
And you guys know I don't really cuss a lot on here, but I am going to make an exception because I am about to break down Bobby King Green versus Jim fucking Miller. I said this in my prediction video, but I wish this fight was on the main card instead of Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. No hate to Bo Nickel. No hate to Cody Brundage either, but this was too good of a fight to have on the early prelims. Like, why would you have a minus 2,000 favorite on the main card? I don't get it. I mean, I I don't want to beat a dead horse because everybody's already complained about it a thousand times, but this fight should have been on the main card, in my opinion. This, this was just too good of a fight. Like, two legends of MMA. Two absolute savages. Like, why wasn't this on the main card? It makes me so mad that this was the second fight of the night. The crowd wasn't even, like, the seats weren't even filled yet. We needed a full crowd for this. This was an excellent fight. This was such a good fight. Such a good fight. Like, I, I still don't think people appreciate this fight enough. Um, so, yeah. So, I think I think this was too good of a fight to have that early on the card. And I will die on that hill. I, I think that this should have been on the main card. But anyways, this fight reminded me of a classic Muay Thai fight. There was a tiny bit of grappling at the end. So it wasn't completely all stand up, but for the most part, this was just clinch work, boxing, kicks, elbows, knees, not much wrestling, not much jujitsu. The art of eight limbs is what it reminded me of. So I love this. I absolutely love this. And I don't know, I, I am a little bit surprised that Jim didn't initiate any grappling exchanges because he is so good on the ground, especially compared to Bobby. I think Jim Miller is a much better grappler than Bobby, but Bobby does fight with his hands down, so he is kind of hard to take down. So I don't know if maybe he just couldn't find an opening to take him down or if that just wasn't his game plan. Um, but Jim Miller on the ground is an absolute problem for anyone. He has an excellent guillotine. He has just a great back control. And he has a dangerous guard from the bottom as well. So he's dangerous. Very dangerous. And I actually do think he is dangerous on the feet too. I think that if this fight would have hit the ground, Bobby Green would have struggled. It was funny. He, he, uh, he was in the media room after his fight, after he won. And Hanato Moicano was fighting Jalen Turner while he was in there. And he was like... Oh, he's a hugger. He's a hugger. And he was talking about Hanato. So he calls the grapplers huggers. And I think that's actually hilarious. Yeah, Bobby's hilarious. Bobby is so fun to watch. Like, I don't care if he wins or loses. He is so fun to watch. I think this fight showed that Bobby is still a an absolute problem for anyone in the striking. Unless you are an elite striker or you have some type of advantage, like a reach advantage or a height advantage, then maybe you can beat him on the feet. But there's not many people that can hang with Bobby on the feet unless they do have elite striking. So I think it showed that. I also think that it showed that Jim Miller, even in his 44th UFC fight, is still an absolute savage. He has an iron chin. I can't believe he gosh I can't believe he didn't get finished um and, and keep in mind Bobby Green is the same guy that slept Grant Dawson in 30 seconds so for Jim Miller to go 15 minutes with him without even shooting a takedown is crazy to me that is crazy I can't believe that he survived um and and actually not only did he survive, but Jim stayed in the fight. Like, he was he was in there the whole time. He never lost focus. He was 100% in the fight. And I think that just says a lot about Jim Miller and his mindset, his mentality. Um, he's a true warrior. So I think that even though he lost, um, I, I still have a ton of respect for Jim Miller in this fight because... He was never out of the fight. You know, he was he was locked in the whole time. Jim Miller showed up ready for war, and so did Bobby. And after the fight, 
Jim posted on his Instagram that he had several injuries. So he had to get 23 stitches for these cuts above and below his eye. He also broke his hand, he said, sometime in the first round. And he broke his toe. So definitely probably going to need some time off. Um, but man, for him to still be in the fight as long as he was. Yeah, I, I just don't know what's going to break this guy. I really don't. Like, Lyme disease couldn't break him. <laughs> he didn't even stop fighting when he was battling Lyme disease. Like, I don't think people realize how hard it is to not only fight, but like compete in the UFC with a chronic illness like that is... It just blows my mind. It is impossible to break Jim Miller. It's impossible. I, I'm convinced. Because Lyme disease couldn't break him. Bobby Green couldn't break him. With a broken hand, cut, cuts above his eye, below his eye. Probably couldn't see half the fight. I don't think people quite understand, like... I have lupus, right? Look at my hand. This is what I've been dealing with for the past like month. Uh, everywhere. Not even just my hand, like everywhere. And it, it, you know, it sucks. It's annoying. It's not the end of the world. I'm not like dying. But I just, when I'm having a flare up, like I think about that. And that's probably similar to what Jim dealt with when he was battling Lyme disease, because they have very similar symptoms. Not completely the same, but pretty similar. And so I'm thinking of when I was dealing with a full-blown flare-up, like right now I'm dealing with a flare-up, but it's one that I can power through. I'm not completely, you know, debilitated, but I've had flare-ups in the past where I was completely debilitated, and I imagine that is the point that he has gotten to in the past with Lyme disease. And I cannot imagine, I couldn't even do like an amateur boxing fight, let alone compete in the UFC. I mean, it's just, it blows my mind. This was his 44th UFC fight. So he's made it this far. It's just, God, it blows my mind. It really does. Like I have so much respect for Jim Miller. It's just because I know, like I said, I've, I have lupus. I know how hard it is to deal with this type of stuff. So I think that's why for me, it, it just resonates even more with me and it's it's uh it's really impressive and and I think it, it, you can't teach that either you can teach somebody how to strike you can teach somebody how to grapple you can teach somebody how to you know slip punches but you can't teach them how to be a dog you can't teach that Jim Miller has that and that's why I'll always be a Jim Miller fan um, and, and I know that he, you know, probably is going to take some time off, but I think he's still got some fight left in him. You know, I, I don't think he's done. I think that this was definitely a bad loss, uh, as far as like injury wise and damage wise. But I think that, you know, I think he could come back from this and I think he's still got some fights left in him. So I'm not counting Jim Miller out quite yet. And and since he's probably going to take some time off, I would imagine, uh, after taking that much damage, I would like to see Jim Miller at the commentary desk. I think for maybe Contender Series or like an Apex fight night, I mean, he's seen everything. He's done everything in the UFC. He has the most fights in the UFC, the most wins in the UFC, the most... Like, this guy's a legend. And... I think it would be, I think he would be incredible at commentary. He's very professional. He's very well-spoken. He knows everything about the company. He knows everything about the UFC. He's familiar with the rules. He's familiar with the fighters, just the way that everything works. So I cannot think of anyone who would be more perfect for that role than Jim fucking Miller, honestly. And, and getting back to Bobby Green, holy shit, I... <laughs> I don't know who I want to see him face next. Uh, he talked about wanting to fight Patty. And I definitely think that's a winnable fight for Bobby. It is a little confusing to call out somebody who's lower, you know, who's not even ranked. But it is Bobby Green and there are not a ton of 
matchups in the division that make sense for him. So I guess that does make sense. And Patty has a big name. So I would be interested to see that fight. I think it's a winnable fight for Bobby. And I do actually think it's a good matchup for him. I don't think Patty will be able to handle Bobby striking. I think that his only hope would be the grappling. And we, we know that Bobby does not like grapplers. So... <laughs> Good luck taking him down. I don't know. I don't I don't see Patty really having much for Bobby Green, honestly. I think Bobby Green has just a lot of experience, but um there are some other fights at lightweight that I might have a different opinion, but for that fight, I just wasn't super impressed with Patty, you know. I I'm just I'm I was hopeful when he first kind of came up, but now I'm just it's kind of the hype has kind of died a little bit for me. So I think it would be a great fight for Bobby, and I think that it's a definitely a winnable fight, especially if Bobby can stuff the takedowns and avoid any grappling exchanges. I definitely think that he can win that fight, but we'll see. I don't know. I There's some other ideas in that division, too, that I think would be interesting, like if they rescheduled the, the fight with Dan Hooker or possibly even Moicano would be interesting. Um yeah, there's, there's some interesting fights, but respect to both of these warriors, Bobby Green and Jim Miller, like I said, they deserve this fight to be on the main card, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Great fight. Amazing fight. That was probably, I would say the top three fights of the night for UFC 300 would be Holloway versus Gaethje, Prohaska versus Rakic, and Miller versus Green. I, I think th those are my top three for the whole card. Uh, but moving on, Jessica Andrade versus Marina Rodriguez. So this was a great fight. I thought Andrade won, but it was really back and forth. It was a great fight, like I said. A lot of action. And Jessica seemed to be landing the harder, more impactful strikes in this fight. So I feel like that's why that's what kind of won her the fight. Um, I actually predicted Marina to win. And I know it was a split decision, but I actually I do think that Andrade won it pretty convincingly so it was a close fight it was competitive but I do agree with the judges that I, th I thought Andrade won and I'm excited to see her get back in the win column she's such a monster uh in that division so yeah if they ever do a female BMF fight which they have been talking about I think Andrade would be a great choice for it she's definitely a BMF so um, maybe her in, uh, in another fight with Joanna. That would be sick. I would really like that. But we'll see what they end up doing. I don't know. The next fight on the card was Jalen Turner versus Hinato Moicano. Jalen Turner almost finished this fight. It was pretty insane. I've been trying to kind of figure out what happened there in my head. And I have some ideas. So in the first round... Jalen dropped Hinato pretty badly and it almost looked like he was going to get knocked out. Um, I don't think Hinato was completely out, so I don't disagree with the ref not stopping it. I, I don't think that it really warranted a stoppage necessarily. I mean, we see knockdowns happen all the time, so I think Hinato stayed on the ground because he wanted to invite Jalen into his guard and then try to get a submission off his back. So I think that's th that could be part of the reason why Jalen wanted to try to make it seem like a walk-off KO. But I think the real reason why Jalen didn't go for the kill and didn't continue and throw ground and pound to try to finish the fight, I think is because the Bobby Green fight, his last opponent... That was a really late stoppage, a really bad stoppage, and Bobby took a lot of unnecessary damage. So I actually think that the reason why Jalen Turner didn't go for the kill and didn't have that killer instinct necessarily at that moment is probably because of how the last fight ended and how bad the stoppage was. I think that Jalen is just such a nice person like a caring person he seems like I've watched a lot of his interviews I don't know him personally but he seems like a really nice person and I just think that he maybe even felt guilty for the the Bobby Green stoppage even though it wasn't his fault 
know, it's the ref's job to stop the fight. But I think that it did something to him in his mind. And, and we've seen this before. And I hate to bring this up because Adam Sella is a friend of mine. But when Uriah Hall knocked out Adam Sella on The Ultimate Fighter, <laughs> then, you know, it, it was you could tell Uriah was like really shook up by that because of how bad the knockout was. And I think that might be a similar thing that Jalen Turner is kind of dealing with in his head. So I think he probably wanted to finish the fight, of course, but was hoping that the ref would just stop it. So that way he wouldn't have to do any unnecessary damage to his opponent. It just shows you kind of how respectful and inconsiderate Jalen Turner is um a lot of people are criticizing him for it but I actually I just want to defend him if it if, if he didn't have that happen with Bobby Green I wouldn't be saying this but because of how bad the stoppage was with Bobby Green I just think that that has a lot to do with Jalen's decision not to try to finish the fight so that's my thought on it but at the end of the day, you can't rely on the ref to finish the fight. You know, you, you have to go for the kill. And as much as we don't like to see fighters take unnecessary damage, this that's just, you know, that's how that's how this works. That's how it goes. So he he lost the fight by doing that. You know, he, he could have won the fight. And because he made that decision, you know, then Hanato ended up turning the fight around and getting a second round finish, a second round TKO. So I think that this is really good for Hanato. This is the best possible time that Hanato could be getting a win. He's on UFC 300. He just started his podcast, Show Me the Money. He has the the podcast with, or yeah, the Show Me the Money podcast. That's the one with, um, gosh, my nose itches. That's the one. So it's, Jesus. Bree, use your brain. The Show Me the Money podcast, that's the one with Maddie Betts and Gilbert Burns. So that's the one he just started. And he did, he talked about the economy in his post-fight speech. He was talking about private property. He was talking about a book about economics. He was talking about, like, real things that people sh- should know about. And he's really becoming a an icon (laughs) in MMA because, and I, I try to explain this to fighters all the time with like branding yourself. Don't rely on just fighting to brand yourself. Like if you have other interests and you have other things that you do in your free time, share that, you know, like, I mean, if you're comfortable sharing it, like share it with the world. Like if you play guitar, like show people how you play guitar if you're good I mean if you're not very good at it then maybe don't but if you're good at it show your other interests show things that you like to do outside of fighting and do things like Hanato Moicano is doing he's starting a podcast you know what a podcast does for you as a fighter it gives you consistent content and it gives you a reason to talk you know you don't have to rely on people doing interviews with you 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 have your own platform so you always have a voice and you can let people know what's going on you know if if you haven't gotten a fight in a while then people are gonna know because you're probably gonna talk about in your podcast so like things like that I think are important for fighters to really like pay attention to I asked Donato at the media day I said what are some of the best side hustles for MMA fighters and it's because I talk to so many fighters and I I know so many fighters and they're working full-time jobs. They're working, like, some of these jobs they have, I'm like, how are you doing all of this? Like, how is this even possible? (laughs) Like, I, I don't get it. It's crazy. But my point is that Hanato is leading by example for other fighters. He's creating a blueprint for fighters to follow to have a career and have a source of income outside of MMA because we all know that there's not a lot of guarantees in this sport and it's, you know, a judge can take half your paycheck and all these different things can happen. It's it's a really difficult sport to make a living in. And so as much as we really want fighter pay to increase, um, you know, that's going to take time, I think. And so I think it's important that fighters like Hanato 
are using their platform to to show other fighters how to make money, you know? Like you utilize every opportunity that you possibly have to make money, to earn an income for yourself, to achieve financial freedom. And that's so important. So I'm really glad that Hanato mentioned that in his post-fight speech. And I'm glad he talks about business. I'm glad he talks about entrepreneurship in, uh, in his interviews because it's important. It's very important, especially for fighters who are early in their career when you're not making very much money, if any at all. Um, you know, amateur fighters don't get paid. So, And the problem is now, if you're an amateur fighter, you cannot train like an amateur fighter anymore. You have to train like a pro if you want to win. So, and even then you still might not win. That's how hard it is now as an amateur. It is insane sometimes. And of course you still see mitch mismatch fights all the time, but you see that in the pros too. You know, early, early in people's career, you see a lot of mismatches, but, um, and that's why, you know, a lot of times I don't, I take a fighter's record with a grain of salt sometimes because, you know, it, it that doesn't tell the whole story. You have to actually look into it, like who were their opponents, what were their opponents' records, how did they win the fight, you know, how long was the fight, like things like that you have to really uh, pay attention to. Because sometimes a fighter will have like several losses, but they're like all split decisions and they were close fights. So yeah, I think um, I'm going on a little rant here, but I do really appreciate what Hinato has been doing for the sport. I think it's fantastic and I think it's not even gonna help the current fan base and the current you know all the MMA fighters out there that are that are watching this like the up-and-comers like it's not only going to attract them but it's also bringing people from outside of the sport because there's people that are interested in business there's people that are interested in economics and now they're a fan of Hanato because of what he's saying. So now they're going to start watching MMA. So it's it's bringing, it's great. I love everything about it. I think it's fantastic. Anyways, Hanato says he wants Patty next. I love this. I love this. I really do want to see Hanato fight a, a top 10 guy because he is ranked number 10 now. I think it would be good for him to challenge himself and fight somebody in the top 10. There's just not a ton of options. He trains at ATT, so it's kind of tricky. Um, a lot of ATT fighters are in the top 10 at lightweight, so it's a little complicated. But I I think I would like to see him fight. I don't hate the idea of him fighting Patty. Possibly also a fight with Bobby Green or Benil Dariush. I think that either of those fights would be interesting because Dariush is a very good grappler, but Bobby Green is a very good striker. So Hanato definitely could have some opportunities on the ground with Bobby Green. I don't know if striking with Bobby would be wise, but I think he would at least survive on the feet. I don't think he would get finished on the feet. So he would be able to survive long enough to get the, get the fight to the ground and eventually get the submission. And then Benil Dariush, I feel like that fight would be a very high level grappling match, but I do think that Hanato could focus a little bit more on his striking and he does actually have a uh, striking isn't bad. I don't know what I want next for him, but I, I do like the idea of Patty you know, that's not a terrible idea, but, you know, because it would be a money fight, I guess. And he is money Moicano, so I guess it makes sense. But I don't know. It doesn't really get me excited. I think um, I think Bobby Green versus Patty is a lot more interesting. And I think, yeah, maybe maybe Hanato versus, versus Dariush would be interesting. Hanato... No, I don't want him to I don't want him to fight Oliveira. That's a scary fight for Hanato. Never mind. <laughs> if Chandler wasn't about to fight freaking Connor, I would say Chandler versus Hanato. That'd be a great fight. I don't know. There's not a lot of fights that really make any sense for Hanato. Because Gamrot trains at ATT. Chandler is about to fight Connor. Poirier is about to fight Islam and he trains at ATT. Gaethje, uh, I'm assuming he's going to need some time off. Oliveira, that's... Uh, I don't know about that. That No, that's scary. Um, I think Oliveira maybe could... 
I don't even want to see a Gaethje rematch. I don't even want to see that. That's still scary for Gaethje. Even though Oliveira lost, like, his stock went up after that fight. His stock went up. I still think Armand is the better fighter. But Charles Oliveira did not lose any stock in that loss to Armand. Let's get back into the fights. I'm getting way off track here. Sadiq Yusuf versus Diego Lopez. Diego Lopez is a freaking savage. Holy crap. I did not expect this. I did not expect... I thought that... I just didn't think that Diego was going to be technical enough on the feet to beat Sadiq. I mean, Sadiq is an elite striker, uh, but Diego ended up getting a quick finish, and I think he will be an absolute problem in the rematch with Mavsar Evloyev. That is going to be very interesting. Very interesting. And Diego now is ranked number 14 at 145. So he did make his way into the rankings. And Sadiq is still in the top 15, but he was, I think he dropped a couple spots. And then Alex Casares was actually removed from the top 15 at featherweight, which honestly is a little frustrating for me because <laughs> Sean Woodson is about to fight Alex Casares at the May 11th event in St. Louis and Alex Casares at the time that Sean Woodson signed the contract was in the top 15. I believe he was actually ranked number 15 when Sean Woodson got the contract signed with Alex Casares so now that fight is no longer going to have a number next to it so I'm curious if Sean Woodson wins this fight does that get him you know where does that put him in the rankings does he get in the rankings um, if that's the case I don't know I don't know I would hope so I would hope that he would be um, in the rankings but I don't know I don't know very interesting but yeah I thought that was yeah it kind of sucks because it was really exciting that Sean Woodson was about to fight a top 15 guy and now he's not in the top 15 anymore, but he hasn't even fought. So anyways, Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. So Kayla looked absolutely incredible on the ground. She had excellent ground and pound. She eventually found the finish with the choke. It looked like she just really overwhelmed Holly Holm and used her strength and physicality to dominate the fight. She is an absolute monster at 135. Wow. She's gigantic. I think they said she weighed 160 pounds on fight night, and she weighed in at 135. I'm not going to lie. I don't love that because that's probably not good for her body. Um, And I think, I think she'll be able to do it for a couple fights, but I... I just hope that, you know, nothing goes wrong with her weight cuts because that seems dangerous to me. That seems a little dangerous. And I only say this just because, like, I never want to see a fighter, like, go through a really bad, like, health scare. Like, Vicente Luque had a really bad, you know, health situation with his, um, it was like a a blood clot or something like that, um, or brain, brain bleed. That's what it was. So I just never want to see a fighter go through something. I mean, after seeing like cyborg, like, Oh God, that was, that was terrifying. So yeah, it's just more out of concern and care for the fighters that I mentioned that. But if she, if she can do it safely, I support it. I think it's fantastic. I mean, she's now ranked number four at women's 135. And if she can win a title, I think that puts her number one at the, yeah, the the number one combat sports athlete in the world. I think that's what it would put her at. So, um, yeah, that's exciting. That would that would save women's MMA. That would that would definitely propel women's MMA in a great direction if she is able to win a title. And I think she can. I think she can do it. I hope to God they bring back the 145 division before she's done I really hope so really hope so but I don't know I don't know if they're gonna do it I'm not sure we'll see how contender series goes this season then maybe that'll give us an idea of it 
There's just not a ton of women out there fighting at 145. Even on a regional level, a local level, it's just there's not much of it. So hopefully that changes. But anyways, moving on to Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling. Aljamain looked honestly pretty good considering it was his first fight at 145. I asked him at the media day. I said, you know, um, I don't know. Not at the media day. I asked him, I asked Al Jermaine in the media room post-fight, I asked him about not getting the finish. I was like, you know, you mentioned you were disappointed with not getting a finish. And do you feel like that was because you need to settle into the weight class? Or is Calvin just so tough and he's just really hard to finish? And he said it was a little bit of both. So I'm, I, I would probably agree with that assessment. I think it was probably a little bit of both. I think there is a feeling out process in the weight class for some fighters. Not every single fighter is like that, but I think there are some fighters that they have to kind of feel it out, especially when they've been competing at such a high level. Um, I think it's probably easier to move up in weight early in your career. And I think it's really difficult to move up and wait once you've already achieved like champion status. Um, and, and it's obviously still possible because we saw Alex Pereira do it and we've seen other fighters do it very well. But um, and in Max Holloway, you know, Max Holloway was moving up in weight, too. But Max Holloway is um, a different fighter than Aljamain Sterling, definitely. But I thought Aljamain looked good. You know, I think. I think people are being a little criti- overcritical of him. I think that Calvin is just really tough and really hard to finish. I think he wanted to win just as badly as Aljamain wanted to win. And I think that in his next fight, I think we'll see a better performance. I'll give him one fight to ease into the division. I think that's pretty fair. And then, you know, then we'll see how he does in his next fight. I don't think we should really be overly critical of Aljamain in his first fight at 145, honestly, because it's a completely different experience for him. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And he's facing completely different fighters too, you know? So he he called out Ortega, which I think is a great call out. You know, to call out an opponent as tough as Ortega just shows you how game Al Jermaine is. And I think that's great. I think that would be an amazing fight. I would love to see it. And I think the winner of that should probably get the next title shot. So, yeah, Aljamain is now ranked number eight at 145. And Ortega is ranked number three. So, yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Unless something goes down between Diego and Mavsar, that could be interesting. But I think I would rather see Aljamain or Ortega fight for the title over the winner of that fight. So... I I really would love an Ortega title run. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. So that's an interesting fight. I really don't know who wins that fight. I would probably pick Ortega, but I don't know. Aljamain, like I said, his first performance, I don't think is going to tell us a whole lot. Like, I think that is him easing into the weight class. And, you know, he's he's having to face really tough competition right away. So... Um, yeah, but anyways, moving on to what was the fight of the night before Holloway versus Gaethje. This was fight of the night before that. Dana said it. I said it before Dana even came in the media room and said it. I had already said it to somebody else. And this fight was just fantastic. You don't see fights like this at 205 very often. This was a very fast paced fight considering the weight class. And both these guys came just ready for war. They were in great shape. They had so much energy. And the pace of the fight was incredible. Uh, Yuri actually has been criticized a lot for his defense in this fight. But I actually did see a lot of improvements in Yuri's defense. I actually thought that Yuri's head movement and his striking defense for head strikes looked fantastic but his defense for calf kicks not so much not 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 so much there but the interesting thing about Jiri is that he is an offense heavy fighter and it's very similar to Charles Oliveira's style 
And you see this a lot with fighters who have a Muay Thai background, which Yuri does, and Charles Oliveira does too. And I think that, of course, you know, he, especially if he's going to rematch Alex Pereira, I think he will need to make some adjustments to defend the leg kicks better. But I don't really want to see Yuri become too defensive because, like I had said in the media room after his fight, I, I think that... You know, sometimes if you get a little bit too defensive, then it can take away your finishing ability. And I think that's what makes fighters like Yuri and fighters like Charles Oliveira, that's what makes them great finishers, is because sometimes you have to sacrifice some defense in order to be a finisher. And I think that is just, that's what we see all the time in this sport. You know, there are fighters that are very balanced. They have great defense. They have great offense. Uh, Jim Miller is an example of a fighter who I would say is very balanced. And I think that, you know, he has an equal amount of defense as he does offense most of the time. And he has a great ground game. You know, so like fighters like that, fighters like GSP is very balanced. He's probably the best example. Him or Demetrius Johnson is probably the best example. I was trying to think of other fighters that were on UFC 300, but that was kind of the main ones that come to my head but yeah I do think that uh, we might see a different approach from him if he rematches Pereira he kind of mentioned that in um, in his post-fight interview in the media room but I also do like the idea of Prohaska versus Ankalaev as an interim title if Pereira ends up moving up to heavyweight and I do think that Prohaska has the more impressive win against a higher caliber opponent than Ankalaev, but I think that the Ankalaev fight is a more interesting fight for Pereira because he is the one guy who I think actually has a chance to beat Pereira in that division, at least at light heavyweight. So at heavyweight, that's a different story. You know, I don't necessarily have the same thought at heavyweight. I think heavyweight is a much more dangerous division for Pereira. I think that... You know, he's he's very good, but he does have, like I was saying about Yuri, you have to sometimes sacrifice some defense in order to be a finisher, in, or, in order to have real knockout power. And that style works really well for Bobby Green most of the time, but against certain opponents, it doesn't work. That style works really well for Yuri, but against Alex Pereira, it doesn't work. So... I don't know. I think that Yuri does have a chance to win the rematch. I would probably think that Pereira would be a decent favorite there, but at the same time, they both have a lot of power, and Yuri can withstand, um, you know, a certain amount of damage. We saw him withstand a little bit of damage in the Rockets fight to his legs, and I just think that. Pereira has a lot more power, even in the leg kicks, you know, so even though Rakic did land some nice leg kicks, and it seems like he does have power with those, but Pereira, I feel like, just is a little bit of a different level, and and Yuri even said that Rakic doesn't hit nearly as hard as Pereira, Rakic was, like, more forcing his punches, and it wasn't as much power like Pereira, like Pereira is snapping his punches more. I think that's the difference. And so, yeah, I think that um, a rematch with Pereira would be interesting. But like I said, if if those adjustments are made, then I think he would have a chance. But if he fights the way that he fought Rockich, that, yeah, no. There, there's no way. <laughs> there is no way he's going to beat Pereira the same way that he beat Rakic. Absolutely not. But I think it would make sense for Pereira to move up to heavyweight if he can get a fight with John Jones. I, I don't know if Tom Aspinall is a great idea. I think that Tom Aspinall just... He's a natural heavyweight, and he's really good. He has the speed down. He has the timing down. He has that all down. He's he's settled into the division. John Jones is new to the division, and he hasn't had enough cage time in that division, I don't think, 
to present as many problems for Pereira as Aspinall does. I think that Aspinall presents more problems just because he is so much more seasoned in the heavyweight division. So I actually think that Aspinall is a more dangerous fight for Pereira than John Jones. And I know that might sound a little ridiculous, but I'm not saying John Jones isn't capable of beating Pereira. He definitely is. And I would actually think he would be a favorite in that fight. I mean, he would, yeah, he would definitely be a favorite. But I think that Aspinall would would be the bigger problem. Um, I think that... I don't know that John Jones necessarily would finish Pereira. I, and Pereira got his black belt at UFC 300, and I, you know... <laughs> he got a knockout... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it was just funny. And who knows, maybe he already earned it and they wanted to give it to him at a special occasion. You know, sometimes they do that. So whatever, it doesn't matter. But he does have, I think, better grappling than Cyril Gaon. I think he's been probably grappling longer. You know, he's he's Brazilian. It's, you know, it's kind of part of the culture. And so um, I do think that yeah, Pereira. I mean, I, we've seen him in trouble on the ground, especially with Jan Blahovich, but I think since then he's probably made some adjustments there. He just he really hasn't had to use his grappling at all. Not that not that much. Not as much like I actually thought that Hill was going to shoot on him and he didn't he didn't have time. <laughs> he didn't even really get a chance to settle into the fight at all it was it was pretty much Pereira knew exactly what he was going to do as soon as he got in there so that was that was intense but anyways getting back to Yuri versus Rakic gosh so yeah I do think that Ankalaev versus Yuri would be a very interesting fight I think that I would probably want that to be an interim title I would want probably want that to be a five-round fight or if Pereira moves up to heavyweight, you know, I don't know if he's going to vacate 205. That's the big question for me. And I don't know if he's mentioned anything about it. I haven't really had time to like look into it. But um, if he moves up to heavyweight, is he going to vacate light heavyweight? I feel like that would only be right to do because when Jamal got injured, he vacated. When Yuri got injured, he vacated. So... I feel like out of respect, you know, that would probably be the right thing to do, depending on when he's planning to fight at heavyweight. But at the same time, then he can be a simultaneous double champ in heavyweight and light heavyweight, and then a triple champ with you in, if you include his middleweight title. So, yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. But I do think Yuri versus... Uh, Magomed and Kalayev, I do think that's a very interesting fight. And I don't know who wins that fight. I think Ankalaev is a very balanced fighter, kind of like what I was saying earlier. And I think Yuri is all offense, <laughs> which I love. I love that. It, it's so fun to watch. He's, he's becoming a f real fan favorite, and he's now the number one contender at 205. So he's right He's right there, right below the champion. And they just announced Jamal Hill versus Khalil Roundtree, which is an absolute insane fight. So Khalil Roundtree, he trains at Syndicate MMA. And he, he, I would, I would consider, I would consider him a Muay Thai specialist, I would say. Um, I mean, he's, he's really good at Muay Thai. Like his, his Muay Thai is insanely good. And there's not a ton of, Ooh, you know what would be a great fight? Would it be Roundtree versus Yuri. <sighs> that would be insane. Have they fought? Have they fought before? Hold on, guys. I gotta look this up because if Roundtree beats Jamal Hill, then Yuri versus Roundtree. For it would it would have to be for a title. So Yuri would need to either rematch Pereira or if they made a vacant title. But then what do you do with Ankalaev? God, 
Uh, yeah, Yuri and Uncle Liev need to fight. I do think Uncle Liev deserves the title shot. But now that Yuri got a second round finish against Rockich and is the number one contender, uh, yeah, that complicates things. I don't think Roundtree has fought Yuri. That would be an insane fight. Oh my god, that would be nuts. <laughs> no, they've never fought before. Wow. And Khalil Roundtree is on a five fight win streak right now. He's coming off the win over Anthony Smith, the first, or no, third round finish. But before that, he had the first round finish against Chris Dawkins. That was insane. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very excited. Very excited. For Roundtree. Well, okay, let me clarify. I'm excited for Roundtree versus Hill. But here's what I'm not excited about. They're doing that fight at International Fight Week. That's in late June. So it's like two months from now. So Hill is coming off of a knockout. A first round knockout to one of the most dangerous strikers on the planet and he's about to fight a Muay Thai guy in two months? I think I'm taking Roundtree in that fight. Let's move on to the main card. Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. This was overall a great performance from Bo. I wouldn't say he struggled in the first round, but there were some moments in the first round that could have been a little cleaner. Um, but, I mean, this guy is... This was his sixth pro fight. Like, why are people so hard on Bo Nickel? I get it. He's on the main card. I don't think he should have been on the main card either. But you know what? They, the UFC decided that. He didn't decide that. So they put him on the main card. They put all this pressure on him. And... Yeah, and now people are, like, expecting him to be impeccable. And you're not going to be impeccable in your sixth pro fight when you're fighting guys with 15 pro fights. You're just not. He did really well in this fight considering his opponent. You know, Cody, I, I get it. He's not in the top 15. He's not, like, a top guy. But he is very good. And he's a good wrestler. He's very difficult to finish. So I think that Bo did really well, and he's not easy to control on the ground either, you know? And so he gave Bo some problems, and I think that's good. I think that it's good for Bo to experience adversity earlier in his career rather than later. So um, I do think that, you know, in the first round, there were some submission attempts that weren't very effective, and I feel like there were certain positions that he was in that it might have been more effective to use ground and pound. So I think he could have had Cody out of there in the first round if he wouldn't have tried to get so many submissions from like weird positions. But at the end of the day, he was trying to finish the fight, which we love. So, you know, I don't I don't think he really needs any criticism from anyone i mean he's six fights in his pro career so but yeah but he ended up getting the submission in the second round so he called out anthony hernandez and he also has expressed some interest in a fight with shara bullet so i think that's really interesting i do like the anthony hernandez fight for those who don't remember anthony hernandez pulled off one of the biggest upsets when he submitted an adcc champion hadolfo vieda so Anthony Hernandez is a real problem, and I think... Ugh, I'm surprised Bo called him out. That's a hard fight. Like, that's a that's a low-risk, low-reward fight. Like, because if you beat Anthony Hernandez, I mean, yeah, like, that's a big deal because it's a big step up from Cody Brundage, but it's not like you beat Hamzad or it's not like you beat, you know, somebody with a big name. So, yeah, that's a... I admire Bo for that. I think that I respect that. Calling out a tough opponent and taking on, you know, some of the most difficult challenges in the division. You know, I respect that. So I think that's really cool that he called him out. And I would love to see it. So 
Yeah, I do like Anthony Hernandez's chances in that fight, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to pick against Bo Nickel. I don't think I can pick against him just yet because I haven't had a reason to. So, yeah, I think... I don't know. I'm interested to see how Bo is going to do in the top 15. This is where things are going to really get interesting. So I'm excited. And then Charles Oliveira versus Armand Sarukian. So this fight played out pretty much... I wouldn't say exactly how I expected. I expected a little bit of a more dominant performance from Armand, but considering that his opponent is the former champion Charles Oliveira, you know, what What can you do? Charles Oliveira is a very tough guy, and he's very hard to finish. So this was a great showing from Armand Sarukian of not only his offense, but also his defense. Because like I said earlier, Charles Oliveira is a very offense-heavy fighter. He is going to be offensive no matter where the fight goes. He can grapple really well. He has a very dangerous guard. He has great jujitsu from pretty much any position. And he also has great striking. I do think that Armand had a little bit better striking in this fight than Charles. But I do think that Charles presented a lot of problems for Armand on the ground. I just think that Armand is really difficult to finish. He's probably one of the more difficult fighters to finish at 155. So for Charles, I just feel like his style doesn't work very well against a fighter like Armand, especially when the fight goes to decision because Charles is constantly looking for the finish, not necessarily trying to score points. I think Armand is the better three-round fighter, five-round fighter, like to where he has the fight IQ to know um, kind of how to still try to finish the fight, but also, you know, be scoring points in, in making sure that if the fight doesn't end in a finish, that you're going to get your hand raised at the end. So I do think that Armand does have a higher fight IQ than Charles, but I think that Charles, yeah, his stock went up in this fight, I think. I, I don't think this was a bad loss for Charles at all. And actually, if Charles is going to lose a fight, I'd rather see it like this than see him get finished or see him get dominated. I think this is best case scenario for Charles because I do think that Armand is the better fighter. And, and it's not a huge difference. I don't think he's like miles ahead of Charles, but I just think he's He's in his prime right now, you know? He's in his prime, and it shows. He looks like he's in his prime. So that's why he won the fight, and he is now the number one contender at 155, but Poirier is going to get the title shot next because Islam wants to fight June 1st. So they offered Arman Sarukian the next title fight against Islam Makashev. Arman is not going to be ready by June 1st. I would not give him a full camp. And I actually respect Armand for turning the fight down because here's the thing. Islam Akashev just fought his last opponent on short notice. Why does everybody need to fight Islam Akashev on short notice? You know, like, I don't think Armand should, I don't think anybody should fight Islam on short notice. You're not going to win. You're not going to win. You can beat Conor McGregor on short notice. You're not beating Islam Makashev on short notice. I'm just saying. Not happening. It's not. It's not going to happen. I don't care who you are. You're not going to beat Islam Makashev without a full camp. You're you're not. So I do not blame Arman for not taking the fight. Because I do think that Arman has a real chance of beating Islam Makashev. But I, I don't like the idea of him doing that without a full camp. I think... With a full camp, there's m way more of a possibility of him winning. And I do actually really like his chances in that fight. So, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I am a little nervous that Armand could be... Get, he might get screwed out of a title shot, honestly. I could see that possibly happening. I hope it doesn't happen, but it, it's possible because... If Dustin wins, I know that's probably unlikely. Um, just being honest, you know, I'm just giving my honest opinion. I'm a huge Dustin Poirier. I would much rather, so much rather have Dustin Poirier as champion because he's he's fought everybody and he's a savage. He's fought Connor, you know, like he he fought at 145. Like he's Dustin Poirier. He's 
the people's champ basically like <laughs> i like how can you not love dustin poirier but the thing is islam makashev has been so dominant he's such a well-prepared fighter his mental game is untouchable like i just think yeah i i, I really do think it's more likely that islam is gonna win but you know, Dustin Poirier has good boxing and he does love jumping the guillotine. So who knows? I think that, um, I don't think he's going to get Islam with the guillotine, but who knows? I'm mean, Never say never, right? Never say never. But yeah, I, I think that Armand made the right decision. I think he made the right decision turning down that fight without a full camp. But I do think that there's a possibility that he could lose his chance at the title, at least for a while. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but I think it's definitely possible. I think that one possibility for Islam is that if he beats Dustin Poirier, then he moves up to 170. I think if he moved up to 170 and won the title at 170, he would probably retire after that or retire maybe after one title defense at 170. But he has expressed interest in moving up, so that is a possibility. And a lot of people have told me like, oh no, he's going to defend the title at lightweight two times this year. And it's like, yeah, he says that now, but if he gets a dominant finish over Dustin Poirier, you're telling me he's not going to try to call out the winner of Bilal versus Leon, which I've heard is supposed to be booked soon. I haven't seen anything yet, though. So I don't know if it is, but whatever. Um, hopefully Bilal finally gets his title shot. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But anyways, um, yeah, I think that Armand deserves the title shot more than Poirier just because he of the caliber of, of opponent that he beat. And he's never gotten a title shot before, so it it's really interesting. But at the same time, Dustin Poirier has never fought Islam, so that is the more interesting fight right now. But I think that Arman, I really hope he gets the title shot after Poirier. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And I think he would probably rather get the title shot against Islam because Dustin Poirier technically is his teammate. I don't think they really train together anymore, but that technically is his teammate. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they train together. I actually have no idea. Hmm. Interesting. That is interesting to think about. No, I don't think they really are main training partners. I think Dustin trains more with Grant and Gamrot. He trains with Dakota Bush, too. But I can't remember who else he trains with. He trains with somebody else. I can't remember. But I don't think Armand is a main training partner. And, and Armand does, like, half of his camp in Russia, too. So it's not like he's training at ATT the whole time. So I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure who Armand trains mostly with at ATT. That's a good question. But anyways, next fight, Max Holloway versus Justin Gaethje, the BMF title fight. This was the best fight I've ever seen. Wow. Wow. First of all, Justin Gaethje is an absolute gangster. He is a freaking gangster. The fact that Max looked at him, pointed to the center of the octagon, and, and Justin was still game, and he was down for that, is crazy. And when he was talking at the media day, and he said, I don't plan on being alive after my fights, I was like, oh wow. I was like, this fight's gonna be... This fight's gonna be wild. You know, I knew it was gonna be an insane fight when I heard him say that. Because I know how Max is. <laughs> I know how Max is. And I was like, mm, okay, interesting. Very interesting. And Justin doesn't have the best defense in the world. so. But he's got a lot of knockouts. He has a lot of knockouts. So anyways, I thought that Holloway just 
looked incredible. That was a master class. Even if the fight would have gone to the scorecards, it obviously would have been a dominant win for Holloway. He looked incredible. I love Max Holloway at 155. I really want him to stay at 155, but I do think he can beat Taporia, so I do also want to see him fight Taporia. But I really like Max at 145, or at 155, sorry. This is just amazing. It's amazing. I, I feel like... Max had the better footwork than Gaethje. Max had the better movement overall. He had the better defense. Like I said, Justin Gaethje, not really known for his defense. Um, I, I think that Max can do just as much damage, if not more, than Gaethje. And I think that his style of fighting... I'm so glad this fight was five rounds because Max's style of fighting, he's a boxer, you know? I mean, he... He's a boxer, but he threw some nice spinning back kicks in this fight. So he's he's got good kickboxing too, but his style is more, you know, he's he's more known for his boxing. But that works more effectively, like his volume and in, in just his accumulation of damage over over the course of the rounds, that works better in a five round fight. And that's why I feel like sometimes boxers don't do as well in three round fights as they would in a five rounder because they can really get to the conclusion. Like in a boxing fight, you have more rounds, you know? And so I think that having more rounds does work in favor of somebody that has a more boxing heavy style sometimes. Yeah, Max had great head movement also in addition to his footwork, his um, just overall movement, his head movement was just beautiful. He was kind of rolling in and out of his punches, which is just great. I, I love watching Max Holloway striking. It's just incredible. So he said he wants Taporia next, and he does have options, though. I mean, he could have called out Islam if he wanted to. I mean, like, and I wouldn't have been mad about it, but that would have been a fast turnaround, I think, for him, especially after that. Because um, he did take damage in that fight. He took a lot of damage to his leg, and yeah, so... That was, oh my God, that was such a good fight. That was such a good fight. I was, the whole media room was going insane when that knockout happened. That was a, that's the craziest knockout I've ever seen. And I've watched a lot of fights. I've watched old fights. I've watched pride fights. I've watched Muay Thai. I've watched all kinds of stuff. That is the craziest knockout I've ever seen. Ever. The whole fight was insane. All stand up. Beautiful. I love it. So I think Holloway will beat the absolute breaks off of Ilya Taporia. And I hate I hate to pick against Taporia again because he proved me wrong the last time. But how can you pick against Mac, Max Holloway? Max Holloway, oh my god. How can you pick against Max Holloway after he just did that to Justin Gaethje? You can't. You can't. Anyways... Zhang Wei Li versus Yan Zhao Nan. This was an excellent fight, a very technical fight. And Yan almost got finished like at least twice, maybe three times. It was crazy. I don't know how she survived that choke. That choke was so tight. And I feel like she went completely unconscious. I don't know if it's just me, but I thought she went completely unconscious and then just like came back. I'm surprised they didn't finish the fight. I'm surprised, but I'm glad they didn't because it was a great fight and I wanted to see more. So yeah, she survived. <laughs> she survived everything. Zhang Wei Li had a lot for her and she hung in there. Like she took all of it and she actually had some great moments herself. You know, this wasn't, I would say it was a very dominant performance from, from Wei Li, but it wasn't completely one-sided every single round. So, you know, Jan did have some great moments, and I think they just, they had the right two opponents for this fight. This was an excellent fight, and it was just two really well-rounded and highly skilled fighters. That's really what it, what it was to me, and I think that after this win, I think the next fight that makes sense for Zhang Wei Li is Tatiana Suarez. She is 10 and 0. She has a freestyle wrestling background. That is so interesting to me. That fight just really gets me excited. So, I it's hard to pick against Zhang Wei Li because 
of what she's been able to accomplish and just the opponents that she's beaten, the way that she's been beating them. She's so dominant. Um, she's looked incredibly dominant her last few performances. So, um, yeah, I really do love the idea of Tatiana Suarez and I think she's the number one contender right now. So that would make sense. Um, yeah, that, that would be interesting. That would be very interesting, but Whaley is incredible. She is so freaking talented. It's crazy. It is crazy. Because Jan has really good boxing. Really good boxing. And she's got decent ground game too. Like, her ground game in this fight actually really surprised me. So, that was a great fight. Great fight. And then the main event. Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. Wow. Look, I, p I picked Alex to win this fight because it it's Alex. How can you? How can you not? Um, I actually do still think that Jamal is a better overall fighter um, in MMA. I think Alex is a better kickboxer. And I think that... I don't know. I don't know that... I don't know that Alex necessarily needs to be well-rounded. I think he's so good at what he does that I think he should just stick to that, you know? <laughs> I think it's working pretty well for him, so... But I do think that Jamal Hill, he doesn't really use his wrestling, but he has good grappling. So, I don't know. Um, Alex, Alex has one of the most terrifying left hooks I've ever seen. The way he snaps it is crazy. It is crazy. And he keeps his hands pretty low and that's kind of his style. And that's why he's able to generate so much power because of the way that he, you know, his stance and the way he, he carries his hands. It's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um... I almost wish that this fight would have gone longer just to see how Hill was affected by the injury, if it affected him at all. I did see him throw some left hands, and keep in mind he's a southpaw, so his rear leg is his left leg, and I believe his left leg is the one that he injured, his, his left Achilles. So I did kind of see a difference in the power there. It didn't seem like he was generating as much power as he normally did with um, with those punches, but I don't know. I didn't really see enough to get a good assessment on that. I don't think so. It didn't really answer. It did not answer any questions about Jamal Hill because Alex Pereira. We know he has one punch knockout power, so you know if he gets you, yeah, you're you're done. It it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> for most most fighters you know I mean look at look at the opponents that he's put away it's pretty insane um but I think that Pereira he came to the UFC at the perfect time honestly to go for triple champ I think he's probably the biggest star in the UFC right now and I think that this is a great time for him to try to get a fight with John Jones and I know that everybody keeps talking about the Stipe fight, and I get it, but I do think that Pereira versus Jones is way more interesting of a fight. That would probably be the biggest fight, biggest title fight in UFC history because it's a double champ versus a double champ. That would be absolutely insane. So I think that... Why not? Why not do it? I mean, I love Stipe, but... That doesn't, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know, and I know they're not really, John Jones fights don't really, the rankings don't matter as much with John Jones. You know what I mean? But at the same time, I still don't think that fight makes sense. It did at the time when they first booked it, but it doesn't make sense anymore because we have Tom Aspinall, who's the interim champion. And now we have Alex Pereira, who is a double champ and just knocked out one of the most dangerous knockout artists at 205. So, um, yeah. 
I would like to see it. I would rather see Pereira versus Jones than Pereira versus Aspinall. Because it would just be such a huge fight. And there would be a lot of debate. Like right now, everybody would be like, oh, John Jones, he will just take him down and submit him. But the closer we get to that fight, I guarantee you, people, the, the narrative will shift. The narrative will shift and people will be like, well, if if Alex catches him with the left hook and, well, John Jones, he's not really a natural heavyweight. He moved up to heavyweight, so he doesn't have the same kind of speed. And, you know, Alex Pereira, I don't know what his walk around weight is, but he probably walks around just as heavy as some of the heavyweights. So, I don't know. I think it's very interesting. And the heavyweight division is not what it used to be at this point. So, I don't hate it. I just think that Pavlovich and Aspinall are very dangerous fights for Pereira. I think that Cyril Gaon... That's a scary fight for him too, but I think that's a more winnable fight for Alex than the other two. I'm trying to think who else in that division. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I would assume if he moves up to heavyweight, it'll be for a title. I mean, why not? The division is not that deep. They could easily just put him right into a title shot. Especially... I mean, I don't know. I get I get they want Stipe to get his payday, but, like, this isn't, like, why are, why is, why are they making it sound like it's, like, a charity? Like, I'm giving Stipe his money fight. Like, what? I don't know. It's just weird. It's just weird. I don't like it. I love Stipe. I'm a huge, I've always been a Stipe fan. Since I started watching MMA, I've been a Stipe fan, but... That fight just does not get me out of bed. <laughs> like, that fight does not excite me at all. At all. It does not. I don't know why. It just doesn't. Alex Pereira versus John Jones, that's exciting. That is exciting. Just because Pereira has become such a big star. He's like the only guy besides Stipe that business wise would make any sense. Because Aspinall, I just don't think, is a big enough star yet. For John Jones. Because John, like I said, John Jones, he's kind of immune to the rankings. The rankings don't really matter when you're John Jones. So. I don't know. <sighs> it's such a complicated situation. Because if Pereira moves up. And he fights. Let's say he fights John Jones. And he vacates the title then we can do a vacant title between Jiri and Ankalaev. Or we could even throw the winner of Roundtree versus Hill into the mix. There's so many options. So I really don't know what's going to happen there. But I do love the idea of Pereira becoming a triple champ. He would be the first triple champ in UFC history. I know Hen- Henry Cejudo says he's triple champ, but it's not really a UFC triple champ. You know what I mean? So we'll see. We shall see. We'll see if he can do it. I don't know. I do really want to see the rematch with Yuri, though. <sighs> this is so difficult. I guess we'll we'll see what gets announced. We'll see what gets announced. I'm I'm probably jumping the gun a little bit here because they're going to announce probably a bunch of fights this week. I would think. I would I would expect them to after UFC 300. I mean, yeah. Probably over the next couple of weeks we'll see some really awesome fights announced, I think. But very exciting. Very exciting stuff. What a great event. Shout out to Dana White, honestly. That was I don't know if it's just because I was there or just because it was that like let me let me know in the comments what you guys thought. Do you think UFC 300 was the best combat sports event of all time? Do you think it was the best combat sports event of the decade? Like what did what did you think? Where does it rank for you? Let me know in the comments what you think cuz for me I don't know, I haven't watched every single UFC event, you know. I've watched a lot of them. 
I've watched a good majority of them, but I have not watched all of them. So it's hard for me to sit here and say, oh, this was the best event of all time. And I also think, I think that depends on the person. You know, some people like different fighters. Some people like different styles of fights. So, yeah. And some people like the old UFC. You know, some people like how things used to be, like UFC 100. And, um, yeah. So let me let me know what you guys think in the comments where this ranks for you. For me, this was just incredible. I mean... Top to bottom, this card was stacked. Like, I know a lot of people hated on it when it was first announced, but it's just like, now that we've seen it, it's like, what were you guys thinking? Are you, were you insane? There were people coming after me in my comments because I said this card was stacked when it was first announced. People were livid with me when I said that. And now everybody's like, oh, this is the best of it. Oh my God. Like Lucas Tracy. Nobody has original thoughts anymore. Nobody has original thoughts. And part of my process with doing my podcast is I don't watch other people's content until after I record mine. So, like, there's other recap videos. There's other breakdown videos. I don't watch any of those. I watch interviews of the fighters, and that is it. I do not watch any... As soon as somebody starts talking about breakdowns, recaps, or predictions, I don't watch any of that until after I record because I don't want to be influenced by somebody else's opinion. I want to form my own opinions. Why is why is there no original thought? Why are there no more th free thinkers in this universe anymore? Do you know how many people I've seen that they watch other prediction videos before they do their predictions? What are you doing? Why would you need to watch somebody else's prediction video if you're doing the research, you're doing the film study, and you know the sport? There's no reason why you need to watch somebody else's prediction video before you record yours. There's no reason. There is no reason. I hate that. I, I hate it. Because I purposely don't watch other people's predictions before I do mine. And I don't watch other people's breakdowns and recaps before I do mine. If I see it pop on my pop up on my Instagram or my whatever, then, you know, it is what it is. But I don't like purposely go watch them because I just feel like, yeah, there's no original thought anymore. And that's why these narratives always get passed around because Lucas Tracy says this or MMA Guru says this and then everybody's like, oh yeah, and, and they think it's the gospel. But it's like, well, why are they saying that? Did they hear somebody else say it and that's why they're saying it? Or did they actually come up with it in their own head? For someone who claims to be such a big fan of the sport, you know, I, I'm just, it's kind of insane how negative they are constantly. So, it's just funny. But anyways, enough about that clown. I really just am so grateful for the opportunity to do media at UFC 300. That was awesome. That was my first UFC event. My first event live on the scene with Kimura so I'm I'm going to be partnering with Kimura which is very exciting and I will you know kind of keep you guys posted on that but we're working on some really cool stuff I'm going to be writing articles for them they're launching the U.S. Um, I guess branch whatever you want to call it of Kimura so they're a Sweden-based company expanding into the U.S. and I will be the face of the U.S. brand so that is very exciting and I'm excited to cover the UFC St. Louis event next month, May 11th. Hopefully we can get Joaquin Buckley on the card. He did shoot his shot at UFC 300, got on the microphone at the press conference. It was incredibly gangster what he did. I love it. Great branding, great marketing. Just, an, I mean, he, we were talking about it and he's like, you know, you're from St. Louis. All we, all we know how to do is be a savage. It's so true. Like, People in St. Louis, they have a, a type of hustle that you don't find in other places. And I think that that's why we all work really, really hard. Because we have to. We've had to our entire lives. Like, yeah, there's just not as many opportunities there. You know, you don't see as many people doing things like what, what Buckley's doing. Doing what I'm doing. Like, going to these big events. Like, you know, we're kind of landlocked. You know, we're far away from everything and it's expensive to travel anywhere from St. Louis. But, you know, if you grind, you can, you know, figure it out, make it happen um, and be able to do cool things. But it is harder, you know, when you come from a place like that. So the fact that, you know, we're trying to make it in our own 
in our own right. He's trying to make it, you know, as a fighter. And, you know, we've, we've got Sean Woodson who's going to be fighting on the card. And, and he's, you know, he's got dreams of being champion, which I actually do really think he's capable of. And I'm really excited to see his fight with Alex Casares. Um, I do think that, yeah, it's just exciting. It's really exciting to see, you know, when I was in Vegas, I got to see Joaquin Buckley, saw him at the press conference. And then I went to train at Syndicate MMA and Evan Elder was there. Evan Elder is another UFC fighter from St. Louis. So it was really cool. It's like two other St. Louis people and Adam Sella was there. And um, yeah, it's just to see other people from my community out in Vegas and going to these big events and doing really cool things is awesome i think it's great so yeah it's really cool what we're doing in st louis and i'm always going to support you know my community i'm always going to support the the st louis fighters so yeah it's been really cool to see the rise and it's really cool to see what buckley's doing at 170 and now trying to get a spot on a card in his hometown is amazing i hope he gets it i really do he deserves it so um yeah that is really all I've got for you guys. I Like I said, I'm going to do the UFC 300 vlog. So hopefully I'll have that up soon. Um, and then, yeah, I, I will see you guys next week. Um, I appreciate all the support. Again, it, just super grateful for the opportunity. I think that, um, yeah, there's some really cool things coming down the road. So... I'm very excited. I'm very excited. And I think you guys are going to be very excited when you see the things that are in the works. So that's all I'm going to say. But I appreciate you guys. And I will see you next week. Bye.